Welcome to episode 135 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Michael Tabman, who served in the FBI for 24 years. During his early career, he was assigned to an FBI NYPD drug task force where he gained extensive investigative experience. In this episode, Michael Tabman reviews the case of Stephen Shikosha, a coin dealer who was convicted of laundering Colombian drug cartel money by creating phony invoices and buying and reselling the same bars of gold. Shikosha was sentenced to 660 years in prison. After the successful conclusion of this case and others, Michael Tabman rose through the ranks of the FBI, reaching the level of special agent in charge of the Minneapolis division, where he commanded 250 agents throughout three states. Since retiring from the Bureau, Michael Tabman has become a sought-after speaker for corporate events, is called upon as a media crime and security analyst, and at one time had his own radio talk show. He is the author of three books. His novel, Bad Intent, was inspired by the Shikosha money laundering case and his years on the FBI NYPD Drug Task Force. You can learn more about Michael Tabman on his website, michaeltabman.com. You are going to really enjoy this episode, especially if, like me, you've been binge-watching Ozark on Netflix. Actually, I didn't start watching Ozark until after I had conducted this interview. So during the whole time I'm binge watching, I'm thinking about Michael and his money laundering case. For those of you who don't know, Ozark is a series on Netflix. It stars Jason Bateman, who plays the role of a financial advisor laundering millions of dollars for a drug cartel. So after you listen to this episode, if you're not watching Ozark and you have Netflix, you might want to check that out. But before we get to the interview, I'm actually recording this intro just an hour before the new FBI CBS TV series starts. I'm looking forward to watching it. I'm going to review the show for FBI cliches and misconceptions in a review post. And I'm also going to, for the first time, live tweet. So we'll see how that goes. But I did want you to know that if you're a member of my reader team, I have added to the bottom of my monthly newsletter where it says free stuff and you get the reading resource, books about the FBI written by FBI agents. Now you'll also get the FBI cliches reality checklist, which is my list of 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV and movies. If you're not already a member of my reader team, then all you need to do is go to my website, jerrywilliams.com. You can also sign up on my Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author. One last thing, please subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, retired agent Michael Tabman. Hi, Michael. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Thank you for agreeing to come on the show. I was introduced to you through LinkedIn. I read your profile, and I was impressed with everything that you were doing after you retired from the FBI, the radio show, and your books. And I thought, Oh, I want to meet him because, as you know, you're doing some of the same things that that I'm trying to do. We'll talk about that later. But right now, what case did you decide that you wanted to review? It was called Operation Sawbook. It was probably one of the first true drug money laundering cases uh, that we worked on the FBI NYPD Drug Task Force back in the late 80s and early 90s during the time of Pablo Escobar. 
uh, when we're going after the Colombian cocaine coming into New York. Wow, this is going to be a good one. And I know that because you believed in this case so much that it actually inspired you to write a crime novel. It was a backdrop of my uh, second novel, Bad Intent. Uh, I was writing about an experience of being on an FBI, NYPD drug task force. And this case certainly uh, was very exciting in terms of it's new to what we're doing. It, it was the case that put me on the map. As you know, Jerry, but many of the listeners may or may not know, depending on the background, if you're looking to get promoted in the FBI, you have to somehow be noticed. Uh, you can't just be uh, an unknown. So if you get a good case, you do a good job, and, and you get to headquarters, you give them briefings, or just get the attention of someone, much better chance of being promoted in the future than if you just you know, mind your own business, doing things quietly. So uh, that case was a big case. It was it was multi-state, multinational, and we had tremendous success. So I say it was kind of one that kind of put me on the map and uh, just kind of got my career off to a you know, nice start. And I had a case that followed up on that that added to it, but this was the, a very big case and one I'll always remember. Well, I can't wait to get started. Uh, and uh, so we're going we're gonna to do the case review first, and then after that, I'd love to talk to you, you know, for a little bit about all the things that you're doing now. Tell us what squad you were on when you first became involved in this investigation. And, and okay, the well, subject. I guess we need to know the subject of the investigation. Sure. I got to New York as my second office, as most agents did, at, uh, for a small office in Oklahoma City, doing some mattering of things. I came to New York. And eventually I wound up on the FBI NYPD Drug Task Force. It was stationed in Queens at the RA, for your audience, is a resident agency, which is basically a small office, but this being New York, uh, a small office in New York is a big office compared to many parts of the country. There's Station Queens and Jackson Heights Queens. And just due to the demographics of the time, we were quite busy, so all you had to do was walk out the door, and there was just some work waiting for you. So we were targeting the Colombian cocaine uh, coming in, obviously, from Colombia into New York City, which was one of the big epicenters of drug activity, at least at that time. And our goal was to dismantle and disrupt the drug cartel organization. And we were doing it very successfully. We were a pretty active squad, about 15 agents, 15 NYPD detectives, who, in my opinion, are just the most experienced detectives in the world. Uh, what they have seen, what they have done was tremendous. And I, I always looked to them for guidance. I always felt they had the street knowledge that, very few FBI agents could you know, hope to gain their career. So they offered tremendous insight and, and assistance and leadership uh, to the task force. So we're doing mostly by bus. You know, we've got a great undercover agent. Uh, you probably know Big Jack. Wouldn't, I'd be surprised if he wasn't on your show. He, he was doing a tremendous amount of undercover work. We actually know each other from Philadelphia, uh, but he hasn't yeah. been on the show yet. So this will be just another uh, show that I will send him to try to get him to come on. Uh, he'd be a gr I had him on my show, Crimes and Times. Uh, we wow. just talked about undercover work, and really it was one of the more fascinating shows. The insight and the, his experience, not just in narcotics, but in organized crime and corrupt cops, his background is tremendous. So, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend getting a hold of him and <laughs> getting him on the show. So right. we uh, we were on the squad together, again, with agents and detectives. And we do a lot of by bust a lot of very surveillance-intensive wiretaps, of course, and narcotics were, were tremendous. And we're just going after people trafficking drugs. Then one day uh, we got a call from from uh, the HSAC actually to the supervisor, and there was this investigation going on in New York, the New York office in Manhattan, on an organized crime squad. And they weren't making much out of it. And that's I don't mean that as a, as a dig or anything. It's just Jerry, as you know, not every investigation is equal. Not everything's done the same way. So this was an organized crime squad going after a money launderer, a suspected drug money launderer. The reason it was on that squad was that this person, uh, Sakosha, who's now in jail, uh, with a 660-year sentence, which we'll get to, but he was reputed to have ties to the New England mob. Not in any major way. He wasn't a Don, just more of a fence, small-time thief. So he had these organized crime ties. And he was a diamond dealer, a gold dealer in Manhattan, in the Diamond District. And going after from an organized crime perspective, as we were saying, what wasn't working, again, no, no fault of any agent or any squad, 
but there's a methodology to every type of investigation. So what they did, how they attacked, it wasn't really right for that type of case. So we got the case assigned over to us, and I was named the case agent. Just on my lap, no particular reason. I just got lucky. And we went about it the way we go about narcotics investigations, different types of surveillance, different hours, different techniques. And it took a little while, but we started to put together the big picture. And what we saw was this uh, huge man who had this office in one of the buildings in the Diamond District, on the ground floor. You have your diamond dealers that you'll see when you walk through uh, 47th Street. Well, those, and on top of you would have his uh, office. And he would buy and sell gold uh, for people. And what we saw coming in were people carrying bags. But, of course, it was a diff very difficult surveillance. We saw them going to the building. We had to actually get in this, actually see them going to the office, figure out where this was, what exactly was going on. And we saw these uh, people we, we finally tracked coming from either uh, from Colombia or via Colombia from other countries coming into the country and bringing in bags that we suspected were money. Of course, we never stopped the bag because we felt if we did that, we could make a seizure, but there goes the case. Uh, you know, once they're jumped and we seize the money, well, where's that going to lead us? We're going to move elsewhere and we'll have to start all over again. So that was kind of frustrating knowing that we had to let that money get into the system, so to speak. So we uh, watched this happen for a while. We watched the money come in until we developed enough probable cause to get a sneak peek search warrant, uh, enter his place at night, and install a camera. May I just make a little statement there about a sneak peek search warrant? Go off uh, topic for a second. All right, you know, after 9-11, during the Patriot Act, there was a lot of talk about the sneak peek search warrant. And a lot of people felt this was over extending the authority of government. But in reality, we had used one in my case, and this was several years before 9-11. So it was not anything new, and it really wasn't that controversial. It just it not really been codified. And all the sneak and peek warrant meant was that, unlike we see on TV, you're not going to do FBI, let us in, we have a search warrant. We wouldn't do that. We would go in furtively, at, like at night. And we would sneak in, pick the locks, go in there, and instead of taking things out, as you normally do in a search warrant, we left things behind. In this case, a microphone and video camera, which uh, I won't say where we planted it, but we got it planted in a very strategic spot. And it was also a learning experience because uh, we got in there, and the desk was kind of a mess where he had his, his main money launder work. But I started picking up things, and my partner, New York City detective, picked up things. And we got to put it back, and I said to him, did you take a picture of the desk? He said, no, did you? And I said, uh-oh. <laughs> no, we realized we got a little too anxious. Uh, we put things back the best we could, but luckily it was such a mess they didn't even recognize it had been tampered with. And from that, we obviously, once you see what's going on inside, then well, you're the case. I, I, yeah. I do have yeah. a question. Because yeah. I think we need to establish why you do a sneak and peek warrant. It right. may sneak sound obvious, but, you know. Sure, let's, right. So when we go in for a, a warrant, uh, again, we knock on the door, we say FBI, we go in there, we search a home, we search an office, and we leave, we leave with the things that we are taking, the evidence. Uh, let's think of the Michael Cohen search warrant, the most famous one right now possibly out there for the FBI at the time. You come in there and you grab records or you grab evidence, and of course there's rules on the search warrant. You have to knock and announce, you have to do it during certain hours. And when we leave, we will leave an inventory of everything we took and the affidavit that we submitted to the court in support of the search warrant. But we're actually telling the defendant, here is the probable cause we used to convince a judge to give us a search warrant for your premises. So a pretty open uh, process. Not secret or anyone thinks we're there. We tell you why we're there. We show you the paper that we used to get there. And we serve the search warrant. Certainly it's not done, you know, anything in secret. The sneak -a peek search warrant is just the opposite. We get authority by the judge, we don't do this on our own, we ask for the authority to sneak in, that's the word sneak, and look around, peek, sneak and peek. And if we want to do something else, let's plant a, a mic and a video, as we did there, we did it also with a warrant. You know, warrant to plant that to do the Title three intercept of communications. And we get the order to do that. So we're doing it furtively. We go in there at night. Again, as I said, we pick the locks, we disable the alarms, and we don't tell them we were there. They will find out eventually. Obviously, when we go to trial, 
we let them know we did a search warrant. Here's the evidence. But just basically go in there and sneak in, take a look, peek, and then get out. So that's the difference between the search warrant. One very open, the other we don't and disclose that we do until a later time. Right. And what you have to establish with the court is that the evidence that you're seeking, you can't get it any other way. Right. Then we get into, right, even like a wiretap, a search warrant. These are what we call very intrusive methods of investigation, as, as opposed to just following someone around or maybe uh, subpoenaing their telephone records. And by that, I, I don't mean listening to their phone calls. Uh, we call it what's known as a pen register. At least that's what it's called when I was there. We just get the, the number someone's called. These are not considered highly intrusive. When you talk about going into someone's home, searching through their drawers, or when you're going to intercept their communications, we have to convince the judge, we've tried other things, it's not working. And that was the truth. We were out there on surveillance for many hours. We followed people around. We really couldn't, because of the nature of Manhattan, how crowded it was, the, the foot traffic and the vehicular traffic. It was impossible for us to do a truly effective surveillance. We didn't want to stop them, as we said, and seize money to see if it was actually money in there, uh, because that would ruin the case. So we had done all that work, and this was the next best logical investigative step. And again, you have to go to a judge and get permission. We didn't do this on our own, you know, willfulness or our own accord. We had to convince a neutral third party. This was necessary, and the only way to get to where we wanted to be in the investigation. All right, so you've got your equipment installed in his office. What are you finding? Well, now what we're doing, we're seeing people come in with money, bags of money. And because they're in private, they're, pre they're speaking pretty openly about the players and the drug cartel, how the, how the money's going to operate, what's going to happen. And then from the conversations, we're able to tell where the person fits into the hierarchy. Now, who's the courier? Uh, where does this person in the office fit into Sikosha's organization? And you get an idea of maybe who you're going to try to flip as an informant if you want to go that route. You know, who do you think will break first? Who do you want to interview first when the investigation goes down and you start arresting anybody? Who do you think will be most cooperative? You're doing an assessment uh, of your people. And then, of course, you're gathering the evidence. Uh, when everybody, you know, everyone was arrested and they're sitting there looking at tapes of, of themselves handing over money and having these conversations, they looked at us and said, wow, guys, good job. You, know, that's, you don't get that often from the people you arrest. But we did that with subpoenas for bank records. So we were able to tra track deposits right after the money was delivered into certain accounts. That money being wire transferred to foreign accounts, being transferred to gold distributors where they would buy and sell gold. Uh, during the wiretap, I remember we were hearing these guys use certain terms, uh, numbers. And we said, well, that's a code. What could that code be? And we scratch our heads. We're trying to figure out. And I forgot how we figured out, but one day we realized they were only talking about the London spot for gold. Because they would take the money, they would buy for these people uh, gold at a certain percentage, or a certain price rather, and then sell it back at a lower percentage, thought that would be their commission, their big. So they were laundering the money through the gold industry. And it would just be gold moving from one person to the next, just bars of gold moving around, selling to each other, creating phony invoices and just showing it to be legitimate transactions when, in fact, the transactions are fueled by drug money. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. They're actually using the gold, you know, as a money laundering tool. Right. This was just gold that would just move around, with, sometimes within just shelves on certain gold dealers, just bars of gold. And they would just move it from this guy to that guy. Sometimes they didn't move it. They just created phony invoices to show the transaction. They would show a sale to somebody... It may be buying someone's gold in Colombia, and then the wire transfer would be in furtherance of that supposed sale of gold. This was nationwide. Uh, we had uh, cooperation with the office up in New England, where uh, Sikosha was finally sentenced. Uh, I testified up there. We had uh, work with the offices in Miami, who picked up some of our uh, targets that we tracked down there after they left New York to find out where they were, and they cooperated. And then we also had work with the Los Angeles office, where some a lot of that gold was being transacted. Can you take us with a little bit more detail through an actual transaction, you know, involving, you know, the, the transfer of the gold, the money laundering? Could you give us an example of maybe one of the counts that were uh, charged in the indictment? Right. So we charged him with many, many counts of money laundering. I can't remember how many. Uh, again, he got 660 years. 
As a matter of fact, uh, it was interesting. I, I found this out only because of coming on your show, and I was just looking something up on the case, and I found out just a few months ago he's p- petitioned for the government to give back his gold bars that we seized because he needs that money and he felt he didn't have the right to seize it. But it was kind of curious to see that, that he's petitioning. So we start with the most basic that someone in Colombia has a lot of money, and they want to get it laundered into the, into the United States to pay people to buy more drugs, do whatever they got to do. So we'd have people come in sometimes with up to a million dollars. And I remember, I'm getting a little off the subject there, but I remember that when we see five, six hundred thousand, we would think, my God, if we, if we seize that money, what a dent we would put in the operations here. And then we, we found out after we arrested these guys that there have been times when other agencies or PDs knocked them off of five, six hundred thousand dollars. And I would ask them, oh, I was a, with the boss, I forgot the name we used, uh, El Tio, the uncle. I forgot his real name. I'll tell you, was he really mad? He said, yeah, no. He just said, don't do it again. This was not a lot of money. <laughs> so what we perceived as a lot of money was just not a lot of money. So they come in with maybe five, six 600000 million on an occasion. They would take that cash, and they would then go and put that money in the bank, write a receipt for having just sold gold, which they maybe did or didn't, an right, uh, invoice. And if they did, it would be based on their cooperators of someone just taking gold from one company and giving it to them. Like literally just moving on the shelf, so that would that would explain the money to the U.S. banking system. I should remember it's not illegal to put that much money in the system. You just have to account for it, and if you account for it, it may go down as a suspicious activity. But if you claim to be in a business that does a lot of cash, such as gold, bullion, and, and, and diamonds, you're allowed to do that. So that in and of itself is not just handling that kind of much, much money. Is not illegal. So we would then see the money go into that account or other accounts. He would create an invoice saying, thank you, we just bought your gold, and that's why he explained the cash. And then he would sell the gold, maybe back to them or to another shell company, for less money than he bought it. And that would be his bid. So he'd buy it for a million, sell it back for 700000 But it, the gold never well, really transacted. Yeah, right, but you had to show that, because we wouldn't necessarily see that, and no one would be. These are just invoices. That he'd be still, it'd really just be for IRS, uh, you know, for his taxes. And so we, we did bring IRS into the investigation as well. But it is suspicious, but again, there's no one party seeing the big picture. Once they get in there and investigate, and we have to track all those records, you have to track the deposit, the wire transfers, uh, you know, maybe I see these invoices after we did a search or, uh, or did a search warrant and collected evidence, and to track how all the money went, how he was laundering the money. Which, again, we had a lot of conversation on tape as well. How did they find him? How did they discover that he would be the person that would help them launder their money? That we never did find out. He never did cooperate, and we don't know how he made that contact. Uh, and, that, and that's why in my uh, a novel, I, made up, I thought a pretty good story about how they came to find him <laughs> and identify him as the right guy. But, again, he was known as a fence. Uh, he was known to you know, do those small kind of transactions, you know, with the mob. So he did have a bit of a reputation. And I, I don't know how they identified him, but, again, in the criminal world, it's just they have their own circles. Uh, they have their own culture, subculture. And you just, you hear about it. You make inquiries. You send your people up to New York and start asking around. And word gets out, especially, you know, in, in, the, under, in the underground, the mob, the money launderers, uh, they know each other. And he made enough money off of this because, of course, most of it wasn't his money. He had to give it back to the, uh, you know, to the uh, cartels, but he was able to make enough money for this to be oh, yeah. a lucrative for him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're making, uh, I, forgot, I think his big was maybe 10% at the time, and so, you know, he told him a million dollars, 600000 at a time. Uh, he was making pretty good money. He had a nice place in Manhattan and, um, you know, living the life. As a matter of fact, when we arrested him, it was it was getting close to the end of the investigation, and I don't think he had a tip or any inside information. There was really nothing to indicate that. But about a couple of weeks before we were getting ready to take this thing down, he picks up, and again, we wouldn't have known it, but for the wiretap, and he decides to go to Switzerland, I believe. And, you know, probably thinking he wouldn't get extradited there. Well, we called our, our Swiss friends. They were there to meet him at the airport, took him into custody at our request, you know, with lawful order. That, then we just took the case down real quickly <laughs> the next day. And we spread out everybody through New England, Miami, and uh, I think out in L.A. and New York, of course, 
And I think we made about 40, 50 arrests in that day. And I think ultimately through bank accounts, records, worldwide, there was, it was a seizure in the multi, multi millions of dollars. I can see why it uh, caught the attention of headquarters and, and, and you made a name for yourself out of it. Now you, I'm going to have you backtrack a little bit because you use the term big and we have listeners from all over huh. and, and I want to make sure that you explain what the big is. It's really more probably of a Shylock's term when a money law, a lender, someone who's extorting money. So if I lend you money, uh, my VIG would be my commission for lending you that money, and it's usually an extortionate amount of money. So if, if let's say you go to a bank and they'll charge you 4%, I may charge you 30% because you can't get that money legally or, or going through a bank or any other legitimate lender, so I'm taking advantage of that situation, so that's my VIG for lending you money. So here I'm using the term kind of loosely, but it was his commission. It's a commission. So he would do the laundering, and he would get X percentage of how much money he laundered. And that would be his pay for what he did. So VIG is just a way of saying you, you, your, your money that you're taking, the commission you're taking for doing something illegal, but it's usually meant to uh, Im- imply someone lending money illegally. I would love to know where that term originated from. Do you have any idea? I don't, but I can rest assured I'm going to be Googling that after we're done with this. I may even do it while we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's really funny because you hear these terms and you they become part of the vernacular. You know, I, I knew exactly what you meant, but as you were saying it, you know, I realized that others might not. And then I thought to myself, well, where did they even get that from? So it'd be fascinating to, to be able to learn, <laughs> you know, at the same time as we're, uh, as we're providing this information to the listener. Okay, I just got it. I Googled it while we're talking. It okay. Says, Vig, vigorish, V-I-G-O-R-I-S-H, or simply vig, known as juice. Uh, the cut or take is amount charged by a bookmaker or bookie for taking a bet from a gambler. In the United States, it also means the interest on, a, on as we discussed, a, a loan shark. The term originates from the Russian word for winnings. Vigorish. So there we go. Fascinating. Look. So we learned something yeah. too. We did something I always took for granted. I, I'm, we should, I should have known that. <laughs> Good question. Now, yeah, you initially you talked about uh, you know the famous undercover agent uh, Jack Garcia being involved in this. Could you tell us a little bit about what role he played? Actually, he didn't play any in this case. And again, I don't mean as a slight of old friend. We just didn't have an undercover operation on this case. Uh, we it just was no opportunity to introduce anybody. And while drugs usually uh, involve that undercover operation, even money laundering cases, since then we didn't have that. We did identify one individual. Uh, this was the guy taking the money for Sikosha. He was actually the office manager. And we felt he was a really good target to be turned as an informant. You know, sometimes you, you may recall, you get into these disagreements with the U.S. Attorney's Office. That happens at times. In New York, it seems to happen all the time. So uh, we got a lot accomplished. Um, but I don't know why, I'm, you know, even though it was our decision, you know, the investigative agency's decision, the U.S. Attorney's Office just didn't want us doing it. They felt it was this incredible risk. And we're like, you know, the case is pretty much made now. If we just have someone informing on us, it would really be good. They just complained so much, we, we did, they were told, just back off, don't do it. Uh, the way it turns out, as it usually does, the FBI was right, because we arrested this guy. He flipped right away, and he said, God, where you guys been? I was hoping to come through before this. <laughs> it's not, I wouldn't work for anything. And he, but he was so afraid, we actually had to put him in the witness protection program for him to serve out his time because he was so afraid of retaliation from main target or his associates in the cartels. But your main target, I'm sorry, what was his name again? Steve Sikosha. He did not flip. He did not flip. He would not cooperate. We were not surprised. Uh, you know, he probably felt very confident he would beat the charge. Don't know why. We had a pretty strong case, obviously. And, and, and Jerry, as you know, and your audience might imagine, when we take these drug and money laundering cases, mostly drug-related, to court, the FBI has a pretty high rate of success anyway in their prosecutions. But in these cases, we have a really high rate because by the time we get there, we have got people on tape, on video, doing cases, you know, usually with an undercover or on a wiretap. We have, you know, or the transacting money that we've seized, 
what we see as the drugs. We have their fingerprints on there. We have so much information. We have informant tapes that they rarely go to trial on, on these cases. This is one of the few that I actually had to testify on. I, I went up to uh, New England to testify, and it just was awkward. It was about, I think it was up there for a couple of hours, and he had to stand during testimony. He just sit down for some reason. Just found that so awkward. Like, you know, what do you do with your hands? You know, when I was start getting uncomfortable, you start fidgeting when you when you stand there. I just found it such an awkward way to testify. But nevertheless, we did it. And and again, 660 years, everybody got convicted. Very strong case. Excellent. Would you say that when you started this investigation, I guess there's always the hope that your target is going to eventually cooperate? Absolutely. You. There's nothing like having human intelligence. I certainly want it while the case is going on and before it have someone telling you what's going on, having someone in the organization, hearing from somebody is always great. But you always want to vet what they're saying also. You never want to uh, be played by an informant. And I think if you look back in your history and you and I served around the same years, we've had cases in the FBI where agents became too reliant and too trustworthy on their informants. Only get you know bit in the end uh, where they were playing us. So you got to be very careful with informants. They're great assets to have, as we call them, an asset, great resource. But uh, sort of, uh, as Reagan said, you got to trust but verify. You never just run strictly on what an informant says. But to answer your question, yes, you want to have them in there. And then when the case is over, it's always great to have them cooperate. It just puts the case together. It'll wrap up any loose ends. You, you learn a lot. You learn, like, what did we miss? How could we have done better? Is there someone else out there that we need to be targeting or going after? That's part of this conspiracy or this criminal act. So it always helps. But as we learn as agents, you don't want to be reliant upon your person flipping to have a good case. If you are, then you don't have a good prosecutable case. And they'll know that also. So you go in there with a strong hand and you play that hand and then hopefully the person cooperates again to help you. But if they want to go to trial, you need to be secure in the evidence you have. Yeah, I guess the, the key word in the FBI is cooperation. Right, cooperation. Right. Now, you right. say we, we don't we don't interrogate, we interview, right? So, you know, all those uh, plays. But, yeah, it's, it's cooperation, and, and certainly it's just under duress. I mean, they, they, they're trying to cut a deal. And just to the point of, of, of matter here, because we talk a lot now on TV about people, uh, you know, when they cooperate, how can you trust them, they're criminals. But usually, usually we're getting the right story from them, uh, not because they've turned and all of a sudden they've given up their life of crime, but because it is in their best interest at that point to be truthful. So if they cut a deal and they give us a lot of information, and, you know, in these deals that we uh, write with them, as, as you know, it is the caveat that if you lie, this deal is out the window. So if someone could cooperate and give us a lot of information, they start lying about themselves or someone else, they don't get the leniency or anything that we promised to ask for, but we still keep all that information. It's not like we can't use the information. It's not like we give the evidence back. Anything we've gained, by we, I mean the government, the prosecution, by that person cooperating is all to our advantage. So for this person to lie would be contrary to their best interest. So we usually get the right story out of them. And that's why the, we feel you know, fairly uh, comfortable relying on that information. But again, we vet it. We, we uh, verify it. But it's, it's usually the right information. It's, it's usually right. truthful. Right. Yeah, I, I, I guess there, there, there are two terms. You've got your cooperation, and then you've got your corroboration. Exactly, which goes, right, which goes back to what we're saying. You don't want to walk into court, uh, claim someone and say, hey, agent, how do you know? Because my source told me. That's not going to cut it. Uh, juries and judges are rightfully skeptical of sources, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you say, well, here's a source, and you lay out why that source is reliable, and then what you've done to verify the information is correct. So, for example, someone says this guy's laundering money, he's putting money in his accounts. Well, that's good information, but we had to go out and verify that until we found the accounts, and I don't remember how we stumbled on them, and we see millions of dollars going in and you know, millions of dollars going out. Uh, then we say, okay, this guy or this source is giving us good, reliable information. It's such a necessary tool because, again, there may be situations like this where you can't insert an undercover agent, you're going to have to use informant information or you're going to have to use the information of your target after he's been arrested and charged to flip him in order to get the information 
about the people higher than him. It's just the way that we have to, just one of the many tools that we need to use because you can't get information about criminal activity unless you have some way of inserting yourself into the criminal world. Exactly. And in the narcotics world, you know, it's standard, just like you see on TV, you bust one guy, you know, carrying drugs, you're reading the riot act, you'll go to jail, and unless you cooperate, they give us the next guy where they got it from, the next guy. And then we used to do that sometimes working the whole night, just working our way up the chain, going up three, four tiers uh, before we hit, you know, an end. Just keep bringing people in. They keep cooperating, and we see as much drugs, as much uh, money as we can, try to get the intel. Uh, again, we'll see if there's a phone that can maybe be tapped after that or a new target that we go after. We just keep turning people. Uh, again, and, and bringing undercover agents in is not quite as easy as it might seem on TV. You just don't show up yeah, and pretend to be an undercover agent. I mean, pretend to be a drug dealer, rather. You have to have, we have to have a weigh-in, and you have to have the right person who knows what they're doing. Uh, the drug cartels, you know, stupid they ain't. And it's, it's a very delicate and dangerous operation. So it's not quite as easy as people may think from watching television. Well, this case was definitely a very successful case, and, you know, I, I really appreciate you, know, you sharing it with us. I'd like to kind of segue now into, you know, your career after this. I, I know that, uh, you know, you have were successful as an investigator, and so many agents like that and stay in that role, but, of course, we do need managers. We do need leadership. So you ended up going to several leadership roles in the FBI. Right. Well, you know, shortly after that case, a little just the icing on the cake, I picked up another case. And long story short, again, just based on surveillance, uh, we wound up seizing 90 kilos of coke uh, on the highway in New York and taking out three or four guys and weapons and explosives and, and a, um, a DEA fugitive, uh, which I think I also threw in the book as well, just a little extra touch there. Then what happened one day was I was out on a case. I was just in the office one night, and I heard two agents on the radio going out making arrests. And that was kind of unusual. I normally did it in groups, and, you know, no one seemed to know about it. I just thought it was kind of odd. So I heard where they were, and they were kind of close by. So I figured, let me just go out there and help them. So I just drove out there. And just as I got there, they were approaching the guy's car, and we just had a snowstorm, and the car took off. And there was just enough room to get by. He didn't hit the agents, came close to it. Well, I have to be pulling up in my car at the moment. And, you know, I had to shake my head. Am I seeing what I just saw? And next thing you know, I'm in, I'm in a pursuit. And I hadn't done that since I was been a cop. You know, we don't do that often in the FBI. I'm like, all right, where's my red light? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, it took me a second to realize what was happening. Uh, so I'm, I'm chasing him and wound up, he gets out and runs. I managed to convince him that if he doesn't give up, I'm going to shoot him. I didn't really have the right to do that, but I did. When I gave, when he gave up, I'm, I'm patting him down and this guy was, I was 35 at the time. He was 10 years younger than me. He was, he was just buff, you know, a real bodybuilder. And, and I found out later that he'd been wanted for murder. I didn't know at the time. I didn't know what was going on. And I started thinking, wow, this really could have been ugly for me. If I had gone out there and had a, you know, tag this guy, I would have been on the losing end. So that's when I started thinking maybe it's time to go into management. <laughs> that was my, kind of my eye opener at that point. So after that, I went to headquarters as a supervisor in the in intelligence section. I went out from there as the supervisor in Albuquerque for the Drug and Violent Gang Task Force, as well as the intelligence section that we had there, which included our asset forfeiture program. I left there, became ASAC, assistant agent in charge, Kansas City. Uh, after that, I left my family here because I only had a few years left to retire. And my wife said, I'm not moving here. We've got three young boys. This is where, <laughs> this is the place to raise a family uh, in Overland Park, Kansas. So I left, uh, I went on to inspections, which most agents know about. Big bad inspections, though I did enjoy that that very much. I enjoyed doing inspections. After being inspector in charge, I then became special agent in charge of Minneapolis for two years, and then I retired. Since your retirement, you've been extremely busy. You know, you've got your own corporate security consulting agency, and you uh, are doing media. Uh, you're a media contributor. Uh, you talk show host, and uh, and of course the, the books that you're writing. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Okay, right. So when I got out, uh, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I retired in March. So, you know, I really wanted to spend the summer with the family. I still had young kids at home and had lived away for four years and just really needed to decompress. So I really wasn't sure what was going on. Then I just started talking around a businessman, and it was the kind of conversation you expect. They would say, oh, you were FBI, right? 
I, I got something I need you to handle. So that just kind of defined for me, you know, where I went. And so I opened up the corporate security consulting, as many of us do. And I work with companies that have mysterious disappearances of assets, companies that have a misconduct that they want investigated. Uh, we've done some work, even for one, one time, a Fortune 100 company, where we did an inspection based on the fact that they had problems in security. security. They didn't want to solve anything. They just want, this was a company based in Mexico City. Uh, they asked me to come out there, and I hired one of the, an agent that used to do inspections with me. Went out there and just tell, they said, tell us what we're doing wrong. Why are we having ghost employees? Why do we have uh, products showing up in the black and gray market? What are all the problems? So we did a, a one-week inspection, as we did in the FBI, and gave them a big report, and that was very successful. We enjoyed doing that. So we did that kind of work. We worked with law firms. They're the typical work you'd expect. I got to try to stay away from, you know, PI work. I'm not crazy about any of that. If it comes along, I'll, I'll outsource it. Uh, but I try to stay away from that. I also bought a business about five years ago that has to do with transportation compliance. A dry subject, but it's another business that keeps me busy. Then, yes, I got involved with the media just, just by chance. I wasn't really pursuing it. Uh, but one day, uh, a reporter called me and asked me to come over to talk about something that was going on. He got my name from somebody. I don't know who. And he came in and he said to me, he says, I'm looking for Michael Tabman. It's not Michael Tabman. He says, I heard you're retired SAC from the FBI. I said, I am. He said, hmm. I was expecting someone shorter, fatter, bolder, and grumpier. So I, I, uh, <laughs> okay. Now, these are his words. So I said, well, here I am. And uh, so we had a good time. He and I actually became friendly, and I did a lot. And then once you're successful with one station, then the others start calling you. So I do a lot with the media. Again, that's all just gratis. I just enjoy doing it. You know, it's just nice to be asked your opinion. So that kind of gave me some exposure in, in, in the community here. And then last year, uh, late into the election cycle here, some Dems asked me if I'd be interested in running for governor. So it was very late. I gave it some thought. I decided to enter the race. I did enter. I went out there on some debates. thought I did pretty well, pretty happy with my performance. I was getting good feedback. But the reality was I came in very late to the race. I didn't have the infrastructure one needs to run a successful campaign. So I, I backed out before the primaries and threw my support behind one of the leading dem, uh, Democratic uh, front runners right now who's in the race. So I'm very happy in that position, just helping out. Would you ever consider in the future running another campaign, you know, with an early start? I might. I might. I, I, I might. I, I must say I kind of enjoyed it. As much as I enjoy retirement, Jerry, I think you do too. And, and I wouldn't want to be back on the street to the FBI. I'm just too old for that now. But I did enjoy uh, getting my hands dirty, mixing it up, getting out there and debating and, and arguing your points and you know, preparing you know, for this fight, so to speak, this verbal fight. I really enjoyed it. I think it went well, and I, I wouldn't mind doing it again. I, I really enjoyed having my voice heard, saying my piece. Being in the position that you and I are in, we, we've worked our careers, we're in retirement. It was sort of a nothing, I have nothing to lose. So I, I felt I could be honest about my opinions. I, I'm conservative some ways, but I'm liberal other ways, and I'll just express it as I express it. So I did, and it, it went well, but it wasn't the right time. It wasn't for me. But yeah, I would, I would consider it again. I don't know if I definitely would do it, but if I asked and I had the uh, right support, and those supporting me knew my views on everything and were comfortable with that, I, I would consider it. Yeah, and we know that there are many retired and former FBI agents who have had successful political careers. Exactly. Exactly. And, and again, because we have a knowledge and experience, somewhat unique, but I, I think one of the best experiences we get, a skill set that we get from those years, is the critical thinking. We look at so many different issues, and especially if you work your way up management. We handle many things that you handle in business and management. It's, it's a lot of personnel issues, financial issues, office political issues that you have to deal with. So you get a, a pretty broad brush of things that need to be addressed in, in sort of running a government operation. So I think we have a little bit of advantage more so than people would think, even though it was a law enforcement we do a lot of critical thinking, problem solving, and that applies to the responsibilities you have in a public office. All right. The other thing I'd love to talk to you about, you know, since I am also writing crime novels, is a little bit about your uh, your writing career and, and what made you decide that you wanted to do that. Well, it's interesting. When I retired, I had surgery on both my feet. So 
if you think about having nowhere to go and nothing to do, that was it. <laughs> I was literally sitting around. So I just started writing my – actually, both books. My first book, which is a uh, lessons learned book, and it's really a recounting of a lot of my experiences at, on the police department and, of course, mostly the FBI because I spent 24 years there, of things that kind of went wrong mostly. You know, cases that got screwed up, you know, management decisions that were not the right ones that had bad consequences, things on the arrests where people did odd things we wouldn't expect. But it wasn't meant to be a critical review. It was uh, a review to tell us what lesson we could learn in either a thought process or a business process. And so I, I was writing that mostly just really more cathartic. Just because, you know, again, I had a lot of steam I had to blow off. There's all these years I'm sitting around with Again, you know, I'm not really leaving the house much. My feet and one in the cash, one in the boot. Uh, so I had a lot of mental energy, and I really wasn't planning to write it or publish it. And someone encouraged me to do that. Actually, it was one of the reporters who encouraged me to do that. I got very fortunate. I self-published it just to get started. One day I, I, I was introduced somewhere at a meeting, and the people brought up my book. I didn't know they were doing that. Three weeks later, I get an email from one of the corporate executives who was there. It's a long email enjoying my book. That gave me a boost of confidence. Later, the CEO of Dr. Pepper Snapple uh, read my book, gave me a quote. Uh, the, the founder of Rainforest Cafe did the same. So it, it, took, it took off after a while, and it's really been the basis of a lot of my public speaking uh, that I do, some of the teaching that I do. Uh, so that was, it was just was a good start. And then this first novel. Well, what, what's the name of that book? That's called Walking the Corporate Beat, Police School for Business People. And, again, it's just it's different stories of the things that, you know, it, was, it actually starts, I think, uh, one of the first arrests I made, like my first day on patrol, you know, what, I, what I learned from that. And I didn't have any notes, but all these memories just came back to me uh, after all those years. Again, just very cathartic. And then my first novel I wrote at the same time, again, just, just really because I was sitting home with these, you know, with my feet there, I wrote a novel called Midnight Sin. Uh, that was inspired by my years as a police officer when I went from patrol to plain clothes and a serial rape case that we were working at the time. But also, my, it's very dialogue intensive. I really get into the character development. Uh, so the, the stories are almost secondary to the characters. That's just my style. Very dialogue intensive. Just try to get into the true character of young cops, mostly the alpha male personality. So my books are a little, little edgy. You know, language may bother some people, but I, I don't do that for shock value. I just try to do it to show just that's how we spoke. That's what we talked about in the car. That's what we talked about on surveillance. Uh, it's just who we were at the time. And then Bad Intent, uh, it was actually funny. I was, after Midnight Sin came out, a publisher got me, did that. After that came out, another publisher called me, had read Midnight Sin, and asked if I would write a book for him. So I started writing Bad Intent, and I was really writing it from the perspective of an FBI agent, you know, my, my own perspective. Not autobiographical, but just my perspective. And I get a call from one of my old partners, NYPD detectives. I didn't have anybody. He goes, hey, Mikey. Was your, your last book? You talk about cops. How can you name anyone after me? So I said, "You want me to name? I'm, I'm writing a book now about a New York City detective. You want me to name him after you?" He goes, "Yeah." And he starts spelling out his name for me. I said, "I got it. I know your name. I'm going to make it sound close to that." But what was funny was he was such a colorful character. We worked together on organized crime about 30 years ago, short period of time, but we stayed good friends for 30 some odd years. One of my closest friends, and he's such a colorful guy. In, in his mannerisms, the way he talks, his experience, that the whole book, the whole focus, he became the main character rather than the FBI. Because I, it, was, it was so much fun, our conversations, you know, his antics, just the kind of person he was. So the whole character shift changed. In bad attempt, you'll see that the FBI agent becomes a secondary character to the New York City detective. Well, I'm going to put the book cover and a link to that book on uh, this episode's show notes, and I'll also include it in my FBI reading resource. I have a list of books that have been written by my guests. There are crime fiction, true crime, memoirs, and I have a whole list. There's over 40 in there now, and I'll include wow. bad intent uh, in that FBI reading resource. So anybody interested in learning about the FBI from FBI agents, and that should definitely check out that FBI reading resource. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad to know so many of our colleagues are, are writing and doing such wonderful things in their, in their retirement, such as what you're doing with your show. My third book, you know, very similar to, to your book for uh, corporations, you know, I'm writing a book 
uh, right now based on the FBI and book, TV, and movies, you know, some of those cliches and misconceptions. So I would love to ask you that question. As, as, as an, a retired FBI agent, and even when you were in the FBI, when you watched the TV show or when you, you know, watched a movie or, or read a book that involved the FBI, were there any cliches or misconceptions that just made you <laughs> kind of roll your eyes? Yeah, quite a few, as a matter of fact. I really don't watch them uh, for that reason, because I, I understand fiction, I understand fantasy, and I'd say if I had to critique my own writing, I would say that I am too tied to the truth, because write, writing is about fantasy, it is about fiction, and you take license. I sometimes get too stuck on saying, well, how would that happen, or that would never really happen in the FBI, which is really not that significant. The reader doesn't care. Uh but I get caught up in, in when I find fiction becomes improbable or just so ridiculous. Uh, certain shows, I mean, if I think of, I know everyone loves Criminal Minds. I hate to knock that because I know some of our colleagues are consultants on that, people I've had on the show, and I admire what they've done. I, I admire their work. But I look at that and I said, boy, if I had my own personal Garcia and I was an agent, there's a case I wouldn't have solved. Sometimes that just gets beyond the scope of reality. Uh, I remember the show Quantico. I watched that once. I said, oh, boy, I'm never watching this one again. Not big on those shows again because they just get too much fantasy for me. When this new show, FBI, starts, which is being produced by Dick Wolf, who does all the Law and Order and Chicago shows, I'm going to actually blog every week about it and kind of pull out some of the cliches and misconceptions and reality checks, not because I don't think that TV shows sh- should be able to use creative license in order to portray those things, but just so that people who are watching it don't meet an FBI agent and think some of those things really do happen. So it's just a way of giving people an opportunity to enjoy the show, which I plan to be a big fan of the show, but also to get a reality check that that what they see may not necessarily be how it really happens. Oh, since you mentioned Law and Order, if I don't, if I may, uh, Peter Giuliano, who was one of the other producers on Law and Order, he he gave the headline quote to my book Midnight Sin endorsement there that's on the cover, just as an FYI. Very nice, very nice. Well, I like to give my guests the last word. What would you like to say? My last word. Uh, thank you for your years of service. Thank you for the show. I think it's, I love seeing agents out there. Uh, still, you know, spreading the word. I thank, I appreciate the offer. I think it's to be on your show. That's great that we all kind of still stick together and help each other. It's a nice, warm feeling. It's great to hear about what other agents are doing with their lives. Uh, and I think you may recall this again because you came in about the same time I did. I remember in the academy uh, being told a story about agents generally live about seven years after retirement. That's about it. You know, yeah, and the implication. I, I remember that. It was kind of scary here. Yeah, yeah, and the implication also, you know, no one knows what to do after retirement, like we're lost without the FBI. Ain't seeing that, right? Luckily, what I'm seeing is most of my friends are all going on to very healthy and fun careers or whatever we want to do, pursuing our dreams after the FBI. There is life after the Bureau, and we all seem to be enjoying it, and it's great to see us all doing that. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Michael Tabman, You'll find newspaper articles about the Stephen Shikosha case. There's also a link to Michael's novel, Bad Intent, which was inspired by this case. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. And please don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. I don't have a crime fiction recommendation for you today, but don't forget about my crime drama recommendation, Ozark on Netflix. I will tell you, though, that there is this really weird FBI character. The FBI has agents and support employees who are gay. That's not an issue. But this FBI agent is engaged in a hot and heavy sexual relationship with one of his subjects in order to gather evidence and to get the guy to cooperate. You know, I think that's a no-no for the FBI. 
But in spite of that, it's still a great show. But if you are looking for a good crime novel to read, I want to remind you that I have two books in my Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. They're available as ebooks and print paperbacks, and Pay to Play is available as an audiobook. You can get them at Amazon.com. Just remember, I don't have ads on this show. So when you pick up a copy of Pay to Play or Greedy Givers, you're helping to support the podcast. So thank you. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetire.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.